We are continuing this morning with our sermon series on becoming God's person. We have been talking this year, this year of intentional discipleship in thinking about what it means to be the disciple that Jesus has called us to be. And we're listening to Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. We continue that series this morning. Um, just a little uh, foreword, I guess. It, starting next week, we'll be in Lent, and we're going to take a little break from this series, do something else, and we'll come back following Lent. So, but this morning, we are thinking again about becoming God's person, and specifically today, we're thinking about becoming a selfless person. So I invite you to follow along in your order of worship or on the screen or in your bulletin or Bible to listen to Jesus' words for us as he continues through the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5 this morning starting in verse 38. As we begin reading, you will note Jesus is referencing the passage that Valencia read for us earlier in the service. Hear now his words. You have heard that it was said... Eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them also the other cheek. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile... Go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. May God bless the reading and the hearing of this word this morning. Well, every once in a while, when I am standing at the door there greeting folks as they are leaving worship, every once in a while, someone will say to me something like this. Preacher, you started meddling today. (laughs) You stopped preaching and you started meddling. Now, we might use that phrase in different ways. People might mean different things by it, but let me tell you how I understand that and how I interpret that message. I kind of hear the main intended message to me to be, preacher, it's okay if you talk about what God wants from us and what God expects and how we ought to live, but don't start venturing too deeply into my personal life. When you do that, you've gone to meddling. In other words, preaching is good if we talk about people in the Bibles and stories in the Bible and history connected to the Bible and our religion in general. That's fine. And if preaching affirms my hope in going to heaven and if preaching lets me know that, yes, God is loving and forgiving, all that's good. But when preaching starts meddling, it's when we start poking in people's personal lives. Preachers start meddling when they cross that imaginary line that divides the realm of faith from the intimate areas of our personal lives. It becomes too personal, maybe too demanding, maybe too intimate. Well, this meddling becomes downright offensive when preachers actually call out bad behavior, doesn't it? Who does that preacher think that he is? Well, personally, I believe that a preacher is not doing their job unless he or she meddles on occasion. But, of course, I'm the one standing up here getting to talk, right? So I may have a different perspective on it. But the whole point is this. When Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount, when he gets to the section that we just read for this morning, when he gets to this part about turning the other cheek and giving your coat and your shirt and going the second mile, the disciples think he has gone to meddling. So far, Jesus has been challenging, maybe even difficult for us to hear with what he's asked of us. But when he says the things that he says this morning, he is meddling in our personal lives. See, 
earlier when he was talking about being angry and murder, when he was talking about adultery and divorce, we can sit here in the sanctuary and we can look around and we can think to ourselves, I hope that other person is really listening to this sermon. He or she needs to hear that. But this morning, we know Jesus is staring straight into our eyes. He's talking to every one of us. This passage is a tough, demanding word. One scholar says it this way, this teaching is difficult because, quote, it prescribes a course of action which does not come naturally to us. In other words, what Jesus is asking of us here is not something that we just normally or naturally would do on our own. In fact, we could say it's almost the opposite. What Jesus is asking of us goes against the grain of life, so to speak. When someone hurts us or is demanding of us, our natural response is resentment. It is revenge. It is retaliation. When someone asks something of us, before we actually offer it to them, it doesn't come naturally to us to give the greedy person more than he or she asked for. When someone forces us to do something that we don't want to do, why would we ever want to do twice as much as they asked of us? These things are not natural. They're not normal. They're not something we just automatically want to do on our own. So part of what's happening here at this part of the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus is reminding us of this theme that he has been hammering away at in the Sermon on the Mount. And the theme is this, the lifestyle of a Christian, the way of life for someone who wants to be my disciple is much more demanding than the law. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, you have to realize Jesus is saying to his disciples, what I'm going to ask of you is much more demanding than anything you have ever read in the law. See, they knew the law. According to the law, people had learned justice. And here's what justice requires. Justice is an eye for an eye. It is a tooth for a tooth. In other words, whatever a person does to you, you have the right to do that same thing back to the other person. And actually, not only does the law give you that right, to be honest, the law encourages you to enforce justice, to inflict upon the other person the same pain that they caused to you. Whatever harm they did to you, you are supported, encouraged to do the same thing to that person. That is justice, according to the law. Now, in some ways, that to us may sound like revenge, right? Um, In reality, however, the system was actually put in place to impose strict limitations on the kind of punishment that could be given to another person. You see, basically the idea here was that the law says you could punish another person, but only to the same degree that that person punished you. In other words, if the person injured your eye, then you could injure that person's eye, but nothing more, nothing else. So if someone caused damage to your livestock, then you were in the right to have damage or to take some of their livestock, but nothing more, nothing in addition. The law was to be an exact retribution. One eye and nothing more for one eye. One life and nothing more for one life. The law was meant to be an exact justice when harmed. A person could and should seek retribution in the exact same measure to which they had been harmed. That was the law of Moses. That was justice. But Jesus says... 
That's the old way. That is, in fact, Jesus says, the easier way to live. But if you want to be my disciple, I have a higher calling for you. I have a different calling. I have a higher standard than what the law of Moses asked of you. And essentially, Jesus says, here's my higher standard. No retaliation at all. No revenge. No hurting someone who hurt you. No retaliation at all. That's tough. Jesus is telling these followers who always understood equal retribution that that was no longer to be their way of living. They were now called to a very different standard. And Jesus says to them, as my disciple, you are not to harbor a spirit of resentment. If someone injures you, if someone places an inconvenience on you, then show yourself to be above the situation by doing something to that person's advantage. Wow. That is a different way of thinking. But Jesus said, That is the way of Christ. That is the way of my disciples. Now, how would this law actually play itself out? Let's take ourselves back some 2,000 years ago to Palestine. First, let's think of the old way. Let's think how this actually happened in real life. I want you to imagine the scene with me. There's a young Jewish man. He's out working in the field. He is pulling up weeds. He is tending to um, all the crops that he has planted in the ground. And beside him is a little road. And on that road or pathway, a Roman soldier comes walking by. The Roman soldier is carrying a very heavy pack. And he looks and he sees the young Jewish man working in the field. Now, because Rome was the conqueror, Rome had the authority to demand from those they had conquered service, whatever it might be. They could ask of their conquered people to run an errand for them. They could ask them to convey a message. They could ask them to be a courier. In fact, they could ask them to carry a heavy pack for a soldier. But even with the law, there were limits. According to the Roman law, Conquered people could be asked to carry a heavy pack for one mile and no more. One mile. Well, this Roman soldier sees the young man working in the field. He says, I'm tired of carrying this pack. He said, hey, you, come, get my pack. I want you to carry it a mile for me. Think about the hostility. Think about the anger. Think about the resentment this young man feels. He's busy tending to his own work. And this young man is interrupted, not by a friend, but by his arch enemy. The arrogant Roman soldier has applied a law that the young man hated. But he knows if he doesn't obey, he could be arrested or put to death on the spot. So the young man slams down his hoe. He stalks across the field. He picks up the heavy pack. He puts it on his back, and he begins walking down the path. But every step of that journey, his whole body bristles with resentment and anger and hostility toward the cruel Roman soldier. And at last, when that young man reaches the one-mile mark, he throws the pack on the ground, and he looks at the soldier, and he says, Now I have done my duty. You could force me to carry that pack for one mile, but not one inch further. And the only reason you can force me to do that is because Rome occupies Israel. But one day, one day, Israel is going to overthrow Rome. And when that happens, if I ever see your face again, you will pay 10 times for what you have done to me and my people. And the young man turns around and stomps the one-mile journey back to his field. You see, Jesus' listeners knew that story. 
They lived that story. They knew it, not just in their heads. They knew it in their heart. They knew every step of that journey, one mile and one mile back. So when Jesus says, if someone, if a Roman soldier demands that you go one mile with that person, those disciples hope Jesus would say, don't do it. Rebel. Stand up against your oppressors. Stand up for yourself. Don't let someone treat you that way. But that's not what Jesus said. Instead, he says something very different. He says, if that person demands you go a mile, why don't you go two? And when Jesus said that, his disciples said, do what? Are you kidding? Go a second mile? I don't want to go the first mile. You're telling me you want me to go a second mile? If this is the new standard, I don't like it. I don't want to do it. See, this completely new and different standard from Jesus, well, it's tough. It's hard to do. Those disciples bristled against this instruction the same way the young man in the field bristled against being forced to carry that pack for a mile. But this principle, the principle of the turned cheek, the principle of going the second mile, it's so different from what we learn from the world, isn't it? And let me tell you this morning, when you hear these words from Jesus, if you're not challenged, I would say you probably didn't really hear what he said. This is a demanding teaching that goes against everything we have ever heard of how we are to interact with other people in our lives. How are we supposed to apply this teaching? to all of our relationships. Well, I want you to think with me for just a moment about what is Jesus really talking about? Isn't it more than action? Isn't it really about the attitude that we carry with us in what we do? Isn't he really talking more as he has before about what's happening inside of us, even beyond what's happening outside of us? What was the attitude of the young man that I described in the field? Wasn't it something like this? You might be able to make me do this, but I'm not going to do anything more than I have to do. Let me ask you, is that such a prevalent attitude in our world today? Isn't that how people respond to the circumstances and the events of their lives today? The story is told about Henry Ford, who was monitoring his Lincoln plant many years ago. And this particular plant and this one division within the plant was very inefficient. They were constantly losing money. So one night, Henry Ford had an idea. And when everyone was gone, he asked the maintenance crew to cut down a tree outside to make a big log carry it inside the building, put it on the elevator, take it to the top floor of the building and get it off the elevator and put it right in front of the elevator. So the next morning when everyone came to work, when the elevator doors opened on the top floor, this particular division in his plant that was very ineffective and inefficient, they would have to step over the log or they would have to go around it or somebody would have to move it. Mr. Ford put this here because he wanted to see what would happen. The next morning, nothing happened. For three weeks, all the employees got off the elevator, stepped over that log, or went around that log to get to their desk and to do their work. For three weeks. Nobody did anything about it. Now, they talked about it. They talked about it. It was the source of conversation at the water cooler. What is that log doing there? Why? Where's the maintenance crew? Doesn't somebody need to come move this thing? But everybody was thinking, it's not my responsibility. Three weeks later, Mr. Ford showed up and 
invited the whole floor to come together for a meeting. And he told them that he was the one who had put that log there in the first place. He said, I was waiting, waiting to see if anybody, anybody would say, you know, it's not my responsibility, but I'm going to help. I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to get that log out of the way. I'm going to find some way to move it. It's not my responsibility, but I'll do it. He said, none of you did that. And as the story goes, Mr. Ford fired every person who worked on that floor. Isn't that how the world operates, though? That's the world we live in. That's the mindset that is not only taught and ingrained in us from an early age, it is endorsed by the world. If it's not your responsibility, why should you do it? The person who lives by this one mile principle says to themselves, I will do what I'm paid to do. I'll do my job and nothing more. And the world says, yes, that's how you should live. And it ripples out in so many ways. People at work, they do only what they're asked to do and nothing more. Students in school do only what is required of them, just enough to get by, nothing else. In marriage, one partner says, I'm only going to do whatever I think is expected of me, but I'm not going to give any more regardless of the situation. In church, in church, people say sometimes, I'm doing my part. Everybody else needs to step up, right? They need to do their part, and until they do, I'm not going to do any more. But Jesus says, listen. I've got another way for you to live. I've got a different way. In fact, I've got a better way for you to live. If something is forced upon you, don't just do it as forced upon you, but instead go above and beyond. If something is asked of you, don't gripe and complain about it, but instead do even more than that which is asked of you. And Jesus says to us, it is a much better way to live. And we say, Jesus, How is that better? Think about the young man again. What if this had happened? What if when the Roman soldier called him over to pick up the heavy backpack, what if he trotted across the field? What if he picked up the soldier's backpack and he said, I'm ready, let's go. And they started down the journey and the soldier thinks to himself, I've never seen someone with an attitude quite like this. And the young man recognizes and knows what the soldier's thinking. And so he says, oh, look, I don't mind carrying your backpack. Actually, it's kind of a nice break from the work that I was doing in the field. So I don't mind going with you. What's your name? I'm sure you've traveled all over the world serving Rome. What's the most interesting place you've ever been to? And they talk and they talk and they talk and they laugh for the whole mile. And then they just kind of keep going. And when they pass the one mile mark, the soldier says, hey, um, listen, you've already done what was expected. You've already fulfilled it. You, you, You can stop. And the young man says, oh, you know, that's all right. It's just another mile or so into town. Let me carry the backpack into town for you. When we get there, I'll show you where you might be able to find a place to sleep and get something to eat and drink. I've really enjoyed talking with you. What happened? The young man conquered something inside of himself, didn't he? The young man's actions changed some, but what happened inside of him was very different. See, he was the winner in the first and the second mile. In the first scenario, The young man went back to his work furious and filled with hate. For the rest of the day, he was cruel to everyone. He was fuming with anger. He ended up going home and he was upset with his wife and angry with the kids and had arguments with them. And it was resentment and bitterness and hostility toward everyone around him. And he was the one that was hurt the most. The Roman soldier wasn't hurt. He was hurt. We are the losers when we allow ourselves to become filled with anger and hatred in that way. That's what Jesus is teaching. But in the second scenario, 
what a different situation emerges. The young man was joyful when he gets home that evening. In fact, he's so joyful, he tells his wife about the good thing that happened to him that day. And she says to him, you know, I noticed that every time you practice your faith, every time you do that, you come home filled with joy. Living our faith is the essence of what it means to live a joyful life. Blessed are you when you turn the cheek. Blessed are you when you give someone not only your coat, but also your shirt. Blessed are you when you go two miles, when all that is asked of you is one mile. And even more than that, you represent Jesus Christ when you do that. For 2,000 years, Christians have been going above and beyond and giving testimony to the grace of Jesus Christ when they do so. In the last 2,000 years, there have been numerous times when Christians have lived into the joy of their faith, even in difficult circumstances, and others have witnessed Christ. Others say, Something is in that person's life that I want. See, the bottom line is this. When Jesus comes into our hearts, we respond to the events and the circumstances of life very differently than those who do not know the grace of Christ. For after all, we are different. We are saved by grace. And when we are saved by grace, not a second slap on the face, not a lost coat, not going a second mile, none of that can take away the joy of being saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. We are different because we are saved by grace. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give thanks today that you challenge us in our personal relationships to not think first about the self, but to think first about you and your higher standard to which you have called us. Lord, give us faith, give us strength, give us courage to be the people you want us to be in all of our relationships of life. For we make this our prayer in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.